One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Okay, so we are back with a new season of Reaper Miniature Paint-Alongs. And uh, we've got a whole new series of Bones figures picked out. The calendar is out there. If you want to check out what we're going to be painting and you want to get the minis in advance and paint along. And uh, yeah, so today we're going to be painting this archway terrain piece from Reaper Miniatures. It's kind of a cool... Uh, little piece and it's going to give us a chance to go back to doing sort of restart the season with something very simple and we'll talk about some miniature painting basics we're going to um, talk about basics of light basics of highlighting and shading and we're going to do a little bit of weathering and a few little ideas like that I'm looking forward to that so let's just get right into it so the the one that I painted previously, okay, um, the general idea was to have it so that uh, if you put a miniature in the center of that, just kind of stand in there. The lighting of the terrain piece, basically, it's brightest in the center, with the idea that the your eye gets brought to the miniature. So if you're planning out a diorama or something like that this idea that we're going to go with today about creating sort of a, a central focus um, the idea would be to have the the lighting of the terrain piece for your diorama match whatever lighting you're doing on your figure so in this case it doesn't work very well she's lit from this point facing this way and this is lit from above basically in the center if we wanted to match this terrain piece to her, we'd light it from this side so that she matches the light. Okay? So the first idea, anytime we paint any miniature, whether it's just a basic terrain piece or as a figure, is deciding which way is the light shining on the object that we're painting. So what we're going to do today, as I said, we're going to have a central focus. And you can see, just to sort of guide the eye a little bit in the center here, we've got a bit of a brighter white spot. And in the center up here, we've got a brighter white spot. And just to remind us that our light is going to be focused. The light direction is from the top down, but we're going to make the center brighter so that whatever figure we were to put in the center of this, the focus will end up being on the center of the figure. Hope that makes sense. Okay, so... Um, to start with, I painted the whole figure black, um, and that's just to give me a start point so that anything I miss uh, will be black. So effectively, it's going to look like it's in a shadow. Okay. So after that, I went and I used my airbrush to do a bit of a zenithal highlight. That just means I sprayed some ink from the top-down direction. For the way that we're going to be painting today, you don't need to do that. That's really just so that the camera that I'm using doesn't lose its mind trying to figure out uh, what it's supposed to be focused on and it makes it a bit easier for you to see it in the video so start with a very dark color paint the whole miniature black or mix some blue and black paint the whole miniature that color and then that any spots you miss end up being in the shadow okay um, if you're not sure how to start a figure like this if you go to the website uh, link at hecatina.ca slash painting classes in that tab, there's a PDF that has all the instructions on how to join the class. It tells you how to put a first coat of paint on your mini. tells you what colors I generally pick to use. And that'll help you get started in the right direction. Okay. 
So we want this to be a stony looking archway. So we're gonna do a little bit of weathering, uh, but we're also gonna uh, mix in some cool colors to add some interesting variety of color and visual interest into uh, this little terrain piece. So there's sort of two different textures visible right away. We've got these smooth stones in these upright columns and in the edges of the archway. And then in the center, we've got this sort of textured, rougher, more weathered stone. And that's also present in the spaces in between the shapes on the archway. So we're going to make those ones rougher. We're going to give them sort of a dappled, dotted, rough texture. We're going to make some cool colors in there to make the, the pitting look deeper. And we'll do some smooth highlights on the other shapes. Okay. All right. So let's get into it. As per the uh, the picture I had up at the start with the, the paints we're going to use, we're going to use Reaper's Stone Triad as the main basic colors. And we're going to use some Deep Ocean as our blue to make some deeper shadows. We are going to use Carrot Top Red to make some rust streaks. Where we need it, we will use a bit of... Um, this pale green to do some highlighting in the rough stone bits and we will either use creamy ivory or linen white so just basically get a warm off white to um, create the highlights where we need them on the stone we are also going to use a bit of midnight blue and some deep red and that's going to be to create some different shadows uh, wherever we feel like it as we go along in the mini. We'll do that a bit later on in the in the process. And in case some of our highlights are just not light enough, we've got some solid white. And we'll do a demonstration of a bit of black lining or dark lining by mixing some dragon black in to one of the colors, and we use that for the dark line effect. For those of you who are beginners and you don't know what dark lining is, dark lining is where I've gone in and added black lines around every shape at a later stage of the painting to make all the shapes really, really visible and stand out. If you compare those two side by side, the shapes stand out better on the fully painted one, and that's primarily, well, it's a combination of effective highlighting, but also the dark lining makes things really distinct. Okay, I'll just point out one other thing that I did on this. I glued it onto a one inch by two inch sort of flat cavalry base that's just because i find this particular figure falls over when it doesn't have a base on it you don't have to do this but i find it helps to if i'm going to use it for a dungeon tile effectively i find that helps a little bit all right so let's start loading up the paints in the palette yeah uh, for bell the cat the paint list is in the the chat if you scroll up you'll see the paint list and I'm going to just drop it in there again. Just for anybody who needs it. There we go. There's the paint list that I'm going to use today. And remember always, you don't have to use the same paints that I'm using. You just need something similar. And so we're since we're basically doing a, a stone color, I'm going to start out with this sort of blue-gray color. And this is this is Reaper Shadowed Stone. Come on, camera, you can do it. There we go, Shadowed Stone. That camera never cooperates. <laughs> uh, stone Gray is basically our main sort of mid-tone color. Now, for anybody who's watching on Twitch, if you want to see the um, the paint list, it's it's been shared in the Discord channel, and uh, it's. I also streamed it just before I started uh, talking live. So if you scroll back to the start of the video or the start of the stream, you'll see both the paint list and the calendar at the very start of that, of that video. Now, where I wanted to put some additional kind of more interesting colors in there, I'm gonna put a little bit of deep ocean in the palette as well. And I put that at the bottom. 
and you'll notice I've got my paints going from from dark to mid-tone to light on the palette and that's so that as I'm painting if I decide I want more shadow I know I can always move to my left and find a darker color if I need a lighter color I can always move to my right and I'll find lighter color lighter colors to the right so for example when I want to add my creamy ivory onto the palette I'll put that to the right of my weathered stone an even lighter color and I might want to use some linen white and they're about the same sort of lightness I'll put that in the same sort of position as or I might not because that paint's not coming out I'll put it in the same sort of position as the creamy ivory what's the difference between those two paints not much the creamy ivory is a little bit yellower and though I uh, the linen white is a little bit lighter if it comes out of the bottle. What do we do when that happens? We put the pin inside there, we wiggle the pin, and as you pull the pin out, kind of make a spiral with it, and whatever junk is in the, uh, the uh, tip of the bottle should get pulled out when you do that. And then the paint should flow. There we go, now we got some linen white. Okay, and for the rusty color, we want some carrot top red another good one for this is reapers rust orange um, phoenix red can work for this but not quite as well as these rustier colors and I'm also gonna put some deep red on there I just I don't know why I just like this color at the moment I've been using it for all kinds of different things I've been using it a lot in skin tones so I'll probably want to use it today <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll come up with an idea for where to use it later and then finally, I've got this jungle mist color, and I picked this because it's a bit greenish. And uh, for adding a bit of like additional sort of visual highlight um, or interest in that rougher stone, I think that's going to be an interesting color to add. And what have I left out? I've left out midnight blue. I'm not 100% sure I'm going to use midnight blue. I'll add that to the palette later if I decide I want it. I quite often use that color to create shadows. So that's how I've got my palette laid out now, and we'll put that back into the corner of the of the video screen. So there's the palette down there. Right now. So the first thing I'm going to do is I am going to grab the uh, sort of the, the mid-tone color that I'm going to use for everything which is the um, stone gray. And I'm using a fairly large brush. Actually, I'll switch to an even rougher brush. So I'm using quite a big brush. Uh, this is a size four brush. To give you an idea of how big that is, a fairly typical um, miniature painting brush is about that size. That's a size two. Be roughly equivalent to a size two, like. Raphael. So this is what I'm I'm painting with today. And you don't have to use super expensive brushes. I quite often do all this base coating with um, like a basic synthetic brush. It's a bit better if you have one where the, the tip is in good condition and you can get kind of practice with being precise with your paint, pla paint placement. But uh, really any, any sort of larger size synthetic brush will, will work. And then I always have on hand some some smaller ones in case I need them to do something a bit more more detailed. So probably today I'll end up doing most of the rough work with this large brush and do things like the little dabs of color with this smaller brush and the dark lining uh, that I mentioned I'll probably do with this smaller brush as well. All right, let's grab that mid-tone. Now the first thing you'll notice I'm doing in the corner is I'm not just painting directly from that blob of paint. I have my palette set up so that I can move a little bit of paint out of the reservoir, off to the side, and I just kind of work the brush into it, smooth out the paint, and I get a feel for how the paint's going to work today. Weather conditions, humidity, uh, how old your paint is, whether your paint was properly shaken up, it's all going to change how your paint behaves. So what I like to do is just work it on the palette a little bit, get a feel for how it's going to work. If it's too thick, I can always add a bit more paint from there into it. If it's too thin, sorry, if it's too thick, I can add a little bit of water to it. 
just a little bit at a time. Water will really change the way your paint behaves. So I try not to add too much water. And if I thin it too much, I can always thicken it up by adding some more paint right out of the bottle back into the mix. Today, this morning, it was very humid in here. But now it's uh, things are drying out. And now my palette, I don't know if you can see that, but the, the palette paper is drying out like super fast. So I've got my little handy squirt bottle and I'll reload the water into the palette to keep it from drying out on me. It's funny, this morning it was so humid, I put a towel outside in the sun that I used for cleaning something up in the studio. Towel did not dry at all, it was so humid. And then suddenly at about one o'clock, weather changed, towel dried, palette dried, everything in the, my, my poor dog is now lying at the entrance of the studio, just like <laughs> dying from the heat. And everything's drying up fast. All right. Oh, right on. Brilliant. Zox is hanging out in the uh, Twitch stream chat, which is perfect. So I can just focus right here. All right. So my light is basically going to be coming from the top down in the center. I just got, want to keep that in mind all the time as I'm painting. Now, I think I'm going to make these skulls quite light colored. So I'm not really focused on putting this paint on the skulls. I'm really just working on the stone. And my aim at this stage is to get a, just a sort of dappled base coat of this gray stone color pretty much on everything. And you're going to notice that I'm not going to be putting on a perfect coat of paint. Now, on my model, where I've already got some white background color, this is not going to work quite as well as it will if your model starts out black. If your model starts out black and you paint the way that I'm doing right now, you're going to get sort of irregular patches of color like this. And these dark spots are going to look like uh, pits and marks and damage to the stone. So we don't need to have a perfect smooth base coat. We just generally want to get that first coat of color on there. And the other thing I want to be, I'm just going to be careful not to really fill in the shadow black area underneath these skulls with the stone color. So what that'll do is, if I bring the stone color right up to the top of those skulls on the side where the light is hitting them, there's going to be less of a shadow there. If I leave them black on the bottom, they're going to look the bottoms are going to look shadowed in the finished model. So as I'm going along, I'm just thinking to myself, what do I want to leave in shadow? What do I want to have highlighted? So anywhere that the light's going to catch on the top of a surface, like this um, little shelf here, I'm going to put lots of color on top of it. Where the light's not going to catch, like on the bottom of that shelf, I'm not going to put much, uh, much color on there. I'm really focused on the intervening spaces in the middle here at the moment. And we're going to do something a little bit different on these smooth bits of stone. So I'll do this right down through the center. Make sure I got everything up there. It's kind of a fun part of doing this because you're not too worried about making things perfect you're just kind of dabbing the color on there and making little dots and big dots and little dots and big dots making that stone look rough and pitted and weathered getting the top of those skulls okay we got that little shelf there we'll do the same thing again on this side Now, we're going to do the center of this space as well. And you notice the, the angle that I'm holding the brush on is about like that. That means as, as I reach in, I'm going to catch the top of things. It's a little bit like the idea of dry brushing, but it just means that my dots and dabs of paints are catching the top sides of raised surfaces. If I had the brush in like this and I was 
painting from the bottom upwards, I'd catch the bottom of everything. So I keep my brush oriented this way and I work from the top down and that's going to help me get that illusion of light and shadow all over the mini. Now, let's do these side columns which are quite smooth. So now what I'm going to do is basically, let's go from the top down again. I'm going to run the brush lengthwise, these long smooth brush strokes. And that's going to make that stone look a bit smoother than the stone in the center. Got this break in the stone here. And there's two ways to do that. One is just paint over it and keep going. And then later we can come back and put a shadow. Or we can work our way down the column, stop when we get to that break. We want to paint the top lip of that crack, but then we keep going down the length of the, the, the column. Now on yours, you might find that that black looks a little too strong. In the spaces between these columns, I wouldn't worry about that. By the time we're finished making a mess with the shadow color, uh, a lot of that black is going to be, it's going to be gone. Do the same thing. Go smooth, long brush stroke down along there, and then of course afterwards, you're going to come back and paint it in with dark lining. There we go. Long brush strokes down that way. There we go. Now again, this looks a bit different on my mini than it will on yours. If yours is just painted black. Yours is going to look a lot more stark because uh, I've got that first layer of white ink on there. And that's okay. That extra sort of dark uh, shadowy space like I've got showing in here, that's going to look pretty good on your finished model. The equivalent look is probably going to be something like this on your model. You're going to have these very, very strong lines. separating those pillars and see how that, that shadow looks very strong and my doesn't look quite as strong and that's kind of a, a, a downside of the zenithal highlight for this approach at the moment but uh, it's all gonna look good at the end so doing those long straight brush strokes Edge of that break. Go like that. There we go. Okay, so what did we forget? We've got this edge along here. I'm just going to use the tip of the brush to paint that. I'm going to go along it in a long brush stroke. That top of that broken bit, keep going along. The same thing the other side. And on this top edge. Now, um, I decided earlier that I was going to leave the inside edge of that black. Okay, and I'm not really going to focus on painting the outside edge of the model out there. I'm going to focus just for today on the inside part. So let's do this bottom edge in here. You can make this patchy or you can make it smooth. It's totally up to you. I put a bit of sand on mine. And uh, that little bit of sand is going to give it a bit of a rough look anyway. But you can really do it any way you like. Let's put some splotches of color on that 
on that base. Note how very careful I'm being, which is to say not being careful at all. I'm just roughly blocking in where I want my colors to be at this stage. Okay, there we go. Now, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to deliberately shade by placing shadows with our shadow color, which is uh, Reaper Shadowed Stone. If you don't have Reaper Shadowed Stone, you can make it yourself pretty easily just by taking a little bit of whatever gray color you're using. Maybe add just a little bit of the uh, of a blue color like that um, deep ocean, and then add a bit of black into it, and you can make your own darker gray color pretty easy. Stippling. Okay, yeah, I got the question on stippling. So all it means is that instead of doing a long, smooth brush stroke, right, to try to create a smooth starter base coat, okay, so that would be sort of a normal first base, first layer for a base coat. Okay, and if I do that two or three times, uh, I'm going to get a smooth base coat. By stippling, what I mean is doing irregular patterns of dots. Small dots or big dots could also be lines. You can do stippling with multiple lines. And where you build up more of the lines or the more of the dots, you get the appearance of a highlight because there's a concentration of those dots. Okay, so there's, in some parts, of, oh, that was supposed to be lines. In some areas, there's going to be a lot of dots, and it will look like a highlight. Whereas to get a highlight painting a smooth coat, I've got, let's say I want it to be brighter up there. And my second coat of color, I've moved the brush in the direction, so my light's up there. My brush strokes go in the direction of the light. And that pulls the paint pigment closer to the light source. And when I do another coat, I'm going to get another. So now I've got sort of a paler area and a more saturated area at the top, which gives me the appearance of a highlight. The stippling, concentrating the dots here, gives me the impression of a highlight. The dashes here gives me the impression of a highlight. So stippling is making dots or lines versus base coating to make a smooth coat. So you asked if there was another video or a different class on that. If you go to the last season, we did um, a unicorn. And the whole unicorn was painted with dots. And we did a variety of different colors, sizes, shapes of dots to create highlighting and shadows on the unicorn uh, and that so if you want to learn more about stippling we did the whole thing with stippling on that uh, on that unicorn and uh, so the question from uh, HP Sasquatcheris was do I find using a torn piece of sponge dipped in paint and grip with tweezers a good way of stippling and I, I do I, I, I do that quite a lot especially on terrain pieces that are larger when you need to cover a large area to do it but if I'm working on a smaller thing like this, I'll do the stippling just with a pointy brush. Um, and it gives me a bit more control. I can place the dots where I feel like I need them, and I can shift the focus of the dots to a new spot. Whereas with the sponge, you tend to get the same pattern of dots repeated identically several times. And that sometimes doesn't look quite as good. I'll show you exactly what I mean. Let's do a blue dot. Okay, so you're just watching the bottom corner for a second. Let's do this. So, I'll do it right here on this piece of cloth. The patterns 
look very, very similar. Whereas if I do it with a brush, I can choose where the focus of the dots is going to be and where the, uh, the, the concentration of color is going to be to make a highlight. So really, really the only difference between the two approaches is the brush gives you a bit more control and the sponge is a little bit faster. A little bit faster. Once you get really practiced at it, it takes no time at all. Okay, stippling versus base coat. There we go. All right, so let's grab, uh, the last thing I was gonna say is how to make that shadow color. If we add a little bit of black into that um, mix that I made of the gray with a little bit of blue in it, I get a color very, very similar to the shadowy, to the, the Reaper shadowed stone. You, you can really, just with a little bit of practice, mix just about any color you need. Mixing paints is nothing to be uh, afraid of. Just kind of need to learn um, what different colors do when you add them in. So if you want to make something darker, you need to understand value. Light paint versus dark paint. If you want to shift the tint of something, thinking about how color mixing actually works in terms of now, what happens when I mix magenta with cyan? What happens when I mix yellow with cyan or with blue? I understand how your secondary colors and your tertiary colors get, get produced. And then once you've got that idea in your head, easy. To, no, I shouldn't say it's easy. It's not easy. It takes a lot of practice. But it's easier to get there when you've got that sense. And when I was starting out, I kept my color wheel on the table all the time. And while you're learning, having the color wheel on the table uh, will really help until you get it all kind of memorized. All right. A quick check in on those guys. Well done. Zox is taking care of the spammers for me. Brilliant. All right. So, Shadowed Stone. So let's remember, I want my light color basically at the top. So I'm going to start down at the bottom of the model now and say with these steps, okay? I've got my base coat color on the top of the step, or my mid-tone, and I want the lower part of the step to be in shadow. So I'm going to put a dark line of this shadow color below the step. And now I've got the mid-tone on the top and the shadow on the side. Thing like that. Shadows on the side, highlight on the top. That's the general approach I'm going to take now on most of the objects. So this pillar here, I want it to be a little bit darker at the bottom. So I'm going to start down at the bottom. I'm going to put some of this shadow color on the sides of the pillar and at the bottom. And because this was our smoother stone, I'm just going to do long brush strokes to give it that shadow. I'm going to do the same thing on the other piece. A little bit more of a shadow at the bottom and along the side of the column. Does it matter if I make some splashes of this color by mistake in there? It does not, because we're going to stipple some shadow and some highlight into there later on. Okay. I try to do this, like I say, we want to have a relatively smooth looking column. So I'm going to do these in a long, continuous brush stroke instead of with those short stippling style brush strokes. And I want the color concentrated at the bottom. So I'll start it pressing gently at the top and push a bit harder as I get to the bottom. And then I'll make the brush stroke get wider towards the bottom. There we go. We'll just push the paint in there. And same thing on that side column. Right along the outside. A little bit more towards the bottom. And a lot more along that side and down to the bottom. 
Now we're starting to get some light and shadow and shapes in our little archway. Now, I'm going to turn it upside down in my hand now so that I have a little bit better access. And you don't have to do this if you've, you've got space to move. I'm doing this because I need to keep the thing on camera and I won't be able to reach underneath here just at the moment. But what I'm going to do is put this shadow color along the bottom of these little shelves. And I put a little bit of it along the bottom of those skulls. Bottom of that little, I don't know, it's like a little, I don't know, fang or blade shape or something there. Anywhere that I think we need a little bit more of a shadow, I'm going to add a little bit more of the shadow color. So underneath the skulls, where the skulls are casting a shadow on the stone, is what I'm aiming for. Uh, yeah, there we go. Bottom of this shelf over here. Under that skull. Okay, that's kind of what I was looking for. Alright, so that kind of deepened the shadows on those objects. Place I haven't done that yet, that I still need to do that bottom edge of this, these pieces of stone along here. It's going to run the brush along those as well. What happens if I put too much shadow? What if I put a shadow in the wrong spot? Doesn't matter, because in the next step, I'm going to create a highlight with a lighter version of this stone color. And if I make a mistake and I made too much shadow, I'm going to be able to lighten it up in the next step. And that typically is why if you start with a mid-tone color, you want to add in your shadow colors first because it's easier to correct little tiny mistakes. If you want to consider them mistakes, I, a lot of people just kind of roll with it and accept that that's where the paint landed and that's now a feature of their mini. Um, but it's a little bit easier to cover over those uh, light, those dark spots where you wanted light to be, rather than try to go back and like fix it two, three, four times and try to work it out. So start with the midtone, add your shadow. For this approach, start with your midtone, add your shadow, and then correct things by adding more light. And that those little dark spots are going to show through the lighter paints later, but because we're doing that dappled, broken, weathered stone, it'll just look like damage, like chipping. If we were painting, say, a beautiful, smooth, silk dress, I would want to be a lot more careful about accidentally putting black splotches or blue splotches of paint in the middle of that white silk, because they will show through right to the end on the finished model. So we can be rough because we're making a rough object. All right, and then we need to do the the rougher stone area in the middle there. So I'm going to go back and look at this area in here, and I'm going to let's 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 talk, let's do what I was talking about earlier about changing the angle of the brush. So now the brush is going to hit the bottom of any shapes as I do my stippling on this kind of angle. I'm just going to put dots and blobs of paint. And they can be pretty big, it doesn't really matter. But anything, anywhere that I see like a little shape that might have a shadow under it, like these cracks, I'm going to put a little darker shadow blob of color in there. Creating lots of little shadows. A lot of these are going to disappear when I do the next step. But what will be interesting is that when you look at the model from a low angle, you're going to see more shadow. And when you look at the model from a high angle, you're going to see lots of highlights. And that's going to give us that effect of the model appearing to be lit up. Put some dabs and dots and blobs in there. Wherever I feel like I want a little bit more shadow. Really focusing this in on the that rougher, more damaged looking stone. 
and it's okay if these are bigger. When we go to do the light, uh, um, the lighter colored stippling on top, we can make smaller dots. And the combination of those big dots and little dots is going to give us an interesting texture variety. Dots and dots and dots and dots and dots. And you know, it's like I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna pause in a moment here because I know most of you probably don't paint as fast as I do. But you can see like how fast I can choose where I want to put those dots and just kind of work the texture in there. And this would be a lot faster. So for me doing it this way, it's a lot faster than if I did it with a sponge. For you, if you're just learning, you might be being a little bit careful about it. And it might be slower for you to do it this way and faster with a sponge. But you can see how rough that looks now. And that's what I was looking for. I'll turn it back around starting to see that rough look starting to come through okay one more bit of color I'm gonna add I'm gonna do some rough stippling you know that gravel that I added on the base you could also do this as a wash but generally speaking we don't really need to do washes for this type of thing we just do it with our brush and I encourage you to do that like use your brush um, like deliberately apply the, apply the paint while you're learning and avoid techniques like washing and dry brushing while you're learning because you'll get better brush control faster by practicing deliberate placement of the paint rather than rather than relying on the chemical properties of the paint to move the paint where you want it to be or to rely on broad brush strokes that rely on the texture to decide where the paint goes for you with a bit of practice, you'll get better faster. If you rely on those techniques, you progress a bit slower. And it's very easy to learn to do washes and dry brushes later. When you've got good brush control, you'll learn dry brushing in five minutes. But if all you know how to do is dry brushing, it's harder to learn to do deliberate placement like we're doing today. So I just encourage you to focus a bit more on manually placing your colors rather than relying on those bigger techniques. I forgot to start recording again after that. So that whole conversation about making scratches didn't get recorded. To show that briefly as we're stippling, we want to make sure that we stipple the upper edge of any shapes, not the underneath edge. So when we have gouges like this, we make a shadow and we highlight underneath them. Okay, and then they look 3D. We don't do it the other way. We don't highlight the top of it because then it doesn't look like a gouge. It looks just like two blobs of paint. So that's the way we're stippling on the front of the model. Just little dots, little dots. And I'm not worried about the skulls because we're going to do something a little bit different with the skulls in a minute. There we go. It's a great big scratch there. So I'm going to make sure I catch the upper edge of that mostly and not the bottom of the overhanging edge. Okay, and now we got that really distinct scratch showing up there now. There we go. Same thing on the other side. Let's put some green on the other side as well. A few dots and bits in there. I'm actually going to have to switch to a bigger brush because everything is drying out in here so fast today now. Let's go to a bigger brush. The advantage of the bigger brush in this case is that because it's got such a big belly in it, it holds a lot more fluid. 
it doesn't dry out at the tip nearly as fast. And everybody's going to have to be kind of monitoring that depending on their own lo local weather conditions. It's going to be different for everybody. All right, let's keep going. There, looks pretty rough. I'm pretty happy with that. Let's do a little bit more of that. Down through these two rough stone spaces. Again, I'm a little bit more at the top than at the bottom. So we, as we go towards the bottom, we're gonna reduce the number of dots that we make as we go. Unless we have a distinct shape with a, like a, like there's a fairly distinct crack in the stone right there. So we'll highlight that. There's a little ring there. We'll highlight that. And same thing like this scratch. We really want to make sure we bring that out really well. There we go. And again, I'm, this is the angle of my brush as I'm working my way down. So I'm catching the tops of things as I go. Some fairly distinct shapes starting to show up. But much less at the bottom overall than we did at the top. So we've got a pretty distinct lighting difference between the top and the bottom of the model. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. Now, let's talk about those smooth areas that we want to highlight. So, actually, I left out a spot at the top. I left out this part, this triangular piece of stone. So we want to make sure we get the top edge of that. A few little dots around that. And we basically want to make a like a highlighted zone around the skull. Not all the way under the skull, though. You see how the, now the skull is a bit more distinct on this side than it also is on that side? And that's the effect of these lighter colored dots. So we're going to do a little bit more of that on the other side as well. A little bit of a damage in the stone there. And then just outline that whole piece of stone with a ring of lighter dots. There we go. Pretty visible now. Okay. Smooth highlights. This smooth carved piece of stone around the outside. We want our lighter color to end up at the top. So I'm going to start down fairly low down. And a bring my brush basically this is an edge highlight so I'm using the edge of the brush lined up against that shape on this sort of angle and I'm just going to smoothly bring the brush up towards the top so towards the light but now anywhere that there's a break in the stone I'm going to stop lift the brush and then continue Okay, so now that edge has got a highlight. And I want to be sure that wherever that gap is, we want to highlight the lip which would catch the light on each of those broken bits. I want them to be really, really distinct. There we go. 
I'm going to do the same thing down below. And you note the position of the highlight was closer to the top of the model, not like right in the middle. It's going to be the same thing down here. We want the light, the area that the light's going to be catching is going to get more of this highlight. So there, we do a little line across. Made a little mistake there, filled it in a bit too much. That'll happen. We'll fix it later. Keep working my way up. Up to the top like that. We'll do it from the other side. Start down here. Work our way up. Why do I want the brush strokes to go towards the light? It's because wherever I lift the brush, it leaves more paint. See that dot? So by pushing the pigment towards the light when I'm painting with a light paint over a dark paint, I get a natural sort of blend from the shadow towards the light. So we push the brush direction towards the light. You can do the same thing now on the lower edge. This is the angle that I've got the brush on, like this. Working my way up. The next place that we need to do that is going to be on these little shelves. So my light is basically going to be brighter in the center. So I'm not looking at like a uniform single light direction this way. It's kind of a central light. So anything around this periphery, the shadow is going to be stronger on the outside. So my highlights are going to be closer to the middle. Picture it as though like there's a wizard with a torch standing in this or with a light stone standing in the center. So in this case my highlights are gonna go from the edge toward the outside towards the center. And on the other side I'll go the other way. Outside towards the center. Like that. Okay. And we'll do the same thing on the interior edge of this arch. We've got that little break there. We'll highlight that. And we'll do the same thing on the other side. Now, with this kind of highlighting, if there's a lot of water in your paint, you could quite easily get a flood. So, just worth your while to pause as you're going and sort of dab the brush off on the paper towel beside beside the palette. So we clean the brush out, load the brush with paint by rolling the brush in the paint. See the, the white letters on the brush? They roll past as I spin it. So I'm really rolling the brush. And then just dab off the excess by touching the edge of the paper towel. And then you should have a little bit more control when you go to put those little edge highlights on. All right, so this, these central columns get the same sort of treatment. We don't want to start all the way down, down in the shadow. We want to start a little bit closer to this mid-tone area that we had earlier. See the two distinct colors? So close to the join between those two, I'm going to start my brush stroke going upwards. And a little bit closer towards the center of the pillar or the center of the model than the outside. And we're just going to run along like that. And now we've got that highlight towards the top of the model. Is it too much? Is it too bright? Maybe. And start around the same height on the other side. There we go. This brush strokes going upwards. I'm going to do the same thing on the outsides. 
sorry, on the, uh, the these outer pieces of stone. Start around the same height or a little bit higher. Emphasize that bit of damage. Work your way up. Let's go on the other side. Start a little bit higher than we did before, maybe about there. Highlight that bit of damage. And then carry on the rest of the way up. I like it. Let's do a little bit of that in the center of these steps. So we don't want to highlight the whole thing. Let's start maybe like we want the, the highlight to be strongest basically in the center. So I'm going to start out a little bit like that. Work my way from opposite sides into the center. On the second step, I'll start a little bit closer into the center. Same idea. and even closer to the center on the final step. There we go. That gives us a bit of an illusion that there's sort of a spotlight in the center. I think we want to take this same color, either the green or the gray, doesn't really matter. You can mix them up or whatever you like. And these sharp edge shapes, I'm going to put a, an edge highlight, same as what we just did on the top of each of them. I'm going to start on this side and work my way around. Just to bring them out a little bit better. Some of them have some damage, so don't make the highlight continuous. But we do want to just, I think, pick them out a little bit better at this stage. That brush stroke goes the wrong way. There we go. That way. And then... That way. And then this one... Kind of like that. Yeah, I like that. That's going to work. Now, not a heck of a lot of visual interest going on there yet. So let's put a bit of blue, this uh, deep ocean color. Let's mix that with the shadowed stone a bit. So it's going to be quite distinctly blue. And let's put some dabs of that color lower down on our shadow side. So if our light's basically central, I think I need to adjust the focus a little bit. Let's just do that quickly. better. So we're going to put a little bit of this blue into the shadow side. So if our light is sort of central, if we look at a pillar like that, we want a bit of this blue in the outside edge of the pillar. So I'm going to run it along the back, start about halfway up, and pull it from the top towards the bottom because we're putting a darker color now over a lighter color. So we pull away from the light. I do it on the outside of each of these smoother shapes. Pull from the top down to the bottom. 
we're going to see a little bit of that blue color start to appear as these dry. That's what I wanted. Okay, we'll do that on the other side as well. Start fairly close to the top, I think, on the outside edge of that one. Pull from the top to the bottom. This middle one, we want to start in the middle like we did on the other side. I'm going to put the tip of the brush into the little crack there and pull downwards. Pull all the way to the bottom. That one start a little higher like that. There we go. And I want to put a little bit of that color in the outside edge of my steps as well. So for this step, where we made this sort of spotlight color. I'm going to emphasize that a little bit more by surrounding it with some blue. So I'll start in here and pull outwards and push it into the corner. Start a little bit closer in at the bottom step and then pull outwards again. So a little bit of blue in these spots. And do the same thing on the other side. I feel like I want to do a little bit of that out in this sandy, so I'm going to stipple some of that in, kind of in the periphery, out around our spotlight. So why did I add that blue? Because if we have sort of a, a white or a yellowy light source, anywhere that's more in shadow is going to shift a bit towards blue. Why did I choose this deep aqua marine color or deep ocean color? I guess mostly because I just like it. And I like the sort of color effect it has in the shadow. All right. I kind of like that. So let's do the skulls. For the skulls, I'm going to grab the shadow, or sorry, the main stone color, that same stone color we started with. And I'm going to mix in a little bit of, uh, let's use creamy ivory. So, first thing I did was made a mistake. Let me show you what I did. So this, I grabbed some of the stone color from there and I moved it off to the side and then I added in some of that creamy ivory color and it turned green. That's because my brush wasn't properly cleaned. If I put the brush on the side here, you'll see a little bit of blue start to come out. So I accidentally mixed blue into my yellow unintentionally. So I'm going to clean that a couple more times. That's one of the disadvantages of using a larger brush. You really have to be a bit more careful cleaning the brush out. And now I'm going to have to get some new stone color. Oh, this is just that mid-tone gray stone color again. And I can't use this patch because it's full of blue. So I'm going to take some of that over there. Some stone color over there. And this stone color is going to be different from the weathered stone color because we're adding this yellow into it. And this will make our skulls look a little bit slightly different color than other stuff. We're also going to put red on the skulls. All right, let's go back to this, this stuff here. Right on, Zox. Yeah, I, I like these colors a lot because of that warmth they have in them. Whereas that standard sort of stormy gray, misty gray is, is, is a bit colder. They respond really well to having a little bit of yellow put, yellow put into them, which is what we just did. Okay, so now this is going to be the base color of my skulls. So what I want to do, I'm just going to, let's start with the bottom one on the left. And I'm going to basically just like I'm doing a coloring book color in 
paint the skull this color. I am not going to paint the eye sockets in fully. Now on mine, there's some white ink in the this eye sockets in the skulls. If you started from black, you probably have black eye sockets. And that's good. You want to preserve that so they have nice, dark, scary looking shadows in them. There we go. So don't just fill in the eye sockets with this color. And if you can, paint the teeth a little bit separately. And don't fill in the uh, the nose, like that nasal cavity they've got going on. Because the more cleanly and distinctly you can paint these shapes, the better they're going to stand out when we're done. And we'll do all of these little skull guys. So you could treat these in the same way as that stone in behind. You could stipple all these colors on and make the stone, make the uh, the skulls look really irregular. But I I want the skulls to look a little bit smooth. I want them to look more like their skulls, actual skulls that have been stuck onto the wall, as opposed to skulls that were carved from stone. That's the look I'm going for. Now they don't really stand out that distinctly yet. But they will when we do the next layer. So the next layer, I'm taking a big old blob of creamy ivory, throwing it into that mix. And the resulting color is a lot lighter than any of the colors we've used so far. So these skulls are about to kind of get a bump in light color. Start, and I'm going to focus sort of in the center of the forehead to start with. Make that distinct. And I'm going to start by highlighting the side of the skull closer to the center of our little art so that as so the light's coming from the middle. Maybe the side of the, that, the nose, but not the whole thing. A little bit of that eye cavity on the left. But I really focused more towards the right-hand side of the skull. I'm going to go to the equivalent skull on the other side, and I'm going to do the left side from my perspective in the same way. So that the skull is lit more on the left than on the right. And that's going to hint that the light is coming from the center. And the skulls also look creepier when they are not uniformly painted. Something to keep in the back of your mind as a useful tool. When they're perfectly like evenly painted, they just look kind of like... I don't know, I feel they look a bit like a an emoji or something like that straight off of social media, but when you, or like a cheap plastic Halloween skull, if you make the light asymmetric, off-center in some way, the skulls I think look a lot better. That's why we're going to put red on the shadow side of these skulls. The guy in the top, we do the light in the center of his forehead, but then maybe a little bit of light we're going to sort of focus in the center of this guy. Don't have to paint his edges. We're going to paint him mostly focused in the center. There. So he's not perfectly highlighted either. He's a little bit irregular too. All right. Hmm. I need to wait a moment for that to have a little bit of time to dry. So we've got these weird little lightning bolt shapes in the stone. And I was going to make those a bit rusty. So what I want to do, I'm going to actually paint those. I'm going to mix blue and black to get a weird blue-gray sort of color. And I'm going to give those, so basically I just took some stone gray, some deep ocean, and a little touch of black and made a of a darker blue-black color. I'm going to paint these weird shapes. I'm going to paint them completely with this color. Do that slowly and carefully. Try not to spill it over the sides too much. 
and we're going to put we'll give them a shadow of red and we're going to give them some rust does it make sense maybe not doesn't have to I think the last time I did this I painted them with like a copper metallic color and then I gave them a red rusty look even though copper the rust should be like verdigris like green right it's fantasy don't have to follow any rules we don't want to there now my little shapes are picked out a bit Alright. <laughs> Gotta make sure I clean my brush really well. Okay, so now I'm gonna go back to these skulls and I'm gonna use I think I wanna use some of that creamy ivory. I'm gonna throw that into my mix over here. Really lighten it up. And this is going to be my highlight color for the skulls. Same as before, I'm going to start with the one on the left. And I can still see a little bit of the dark gray around the outside edge. Sorry, that's just the airbrush compressor going. still see a bit of that shadow color around the edge of the skull okay and I want to highlight this towards the center of the archway a little bit so I'm not going to completely cover his forehead just kind of a round dot in the part of the forehead of the skull closer towards the center yeah the camera's struggling a little bit with that contrast that's okay same thing on the nose and the teeth focus on that inner side same thing on the other side of the skull yeah same thing on the other ones Anywhere that might catch a little bit of light kind of coming centrally, we'll highlight that. There we go. And we'll focus in the center of this, this one. So those little angles of his outline of his eyes. A little bit of the nose. Those teeth center of his skull try to paint the lower jaw teeth individually if you can make them a little bit more distinct I like it I like it a lot And I think I'm going to come back with just pure linen white. And a few little distinct spots on this guy. So like where the point is on his brow, bridge of his nose, corner of his eye, right in the middle of that skull, like in his forehead, we'll give that a little bit more of a highlight. And I think the top of the center teeth, lower jaw, lower mandible there, just blinging them up just a little tiny bit more. Maybe just one or two dots 
on the outside of round surfaces, a little bit lower down. We want these skulls to look a bit creepy, so we don't want them to paint. Don't want to paint them perfectly. Okay, so now let's paint some weird red shadows on those skulls, just for no particular reason, just to add a bit of color variety and make them look a bit creepy. So I'm going to take that deep red that I had earlier. I'm going to mix some stone gray into that. I'm going to get a sort of a desaturated magenta gray color. I don't want very much of that on my brush, just I'm just going to be making very small lines and dots with that. And where am I going to put that color? I'm going to put it on the outside of those skull shapes. So like we've got that um, that little skull put some just around the bottom edge of that skull and it's barely going to show up it's going to sort of disappear as it darkens and that's kind of what we want a little bit on the outside of that one and just a touch sort of bottom of the cheeks bottom of the jaw around the bottom outside of that skull Can we see that? Hmm. Might even be able to get with a get away with a little bit more. I don't really want to put a lot. I just want a hint of it in there, right? And so the reason I mixed it with a stone gray instead of using it straight is because what it does is it just um, slightly tints the stone gray that's already there towards the deep red color. If I just put the straight stone red or the blood red in there or what is this deep red it might be a bit too much. What this is going to do is add some additional color without significantly darkening or changing the the value of the colors we've already painted the skull. So the skulls are still going to look pretty bright but they'll have this creepy red tint around their outside edge. You could also put this as a shadow in the top of the eye socket and that would add another dimension of creepy. Just a hint of it in there. All right, I like that. If we're feeling particularly, well, I was gonna say we could put more of that in there, but we don't really need to. I kind of like it like that. All right, what should we do next? Let's do some highlighting on these weird little um, magic shapes, whatever they are. I'm going to grab that stone gray, mix the stone gray into that color I used as the base coat. So I'm making a lighter version of the stone gray. You know, I'm going to put a little bit of red in that. Just a bit of red. There we go. So it's more of like a purpley red color now. And I'm going to use that to highlight those shapes. like that. A little bit on the other one as well. I 
So now we've got this archway, which looks pretty simple. It's got blue shadows, red shadows. It's got a couple of different, slightly different variations of highlight color. So let's compare it back to the other one that we started with. Okay. And this one, the red is a lot more obvious. And this one, the blue is a little bit stronger. All right, so let's let's make this one bluer than this one. Let's add some more blue and green into this one. So I'm going to take that shadow stone color with a bit of teal in it, or deep ocean. I'm going to put a few more shadowy dots at the bottom. So the same reason as before, I'm going to invert it. I'm going to do my stippling on the bottom in this direction. I want more of this towards the bottom of the model than the top. And I'm looking for anywhere that I can put a dot. Oh, what happened? There we go, okay. Looking for the bottoms of various shapes and put a little bit of that, a little bit more of that blue into those shapes. A bit more blue along the bottom of the steps. Just kind of increasing the amount of overall blue that's present. Now, I didn't just grab the deep ocean and force it in there. Because it's a terrain piece that another miniature might stand on. Don't want it to be, in this case, super saturated with color. Just want there to be a hint of the color. If I was to take the, the, that teal and just really force it in everywhere, the archway might then be brighter than uh, the miniature standing in the center of it. And we don't want the terrain to be stronger than the mini. We want the mini to be the focus point, right? What I could do, though, is to make more of a focus in the center. We can put some more blue on the outside edges of various shapes. And we could do that up in the ring here, just to make a little bit of a shadow around this outside edge. And that'll darken the overall look of the center. Sorry, it'll darken the overall look of the outside of the terrain piece and make the center of it in here feel a little bit lighter. I don't know if that's too advanced an idea at this stage, but it's making the colors look good, I guess. Am I just messing around? Maybe a little bit. Is that okay? I hope so. Okay, I think that worked. We have a bit of darkness on that edge and the center of this is quite a bit lighter in appearance. Right on. Okay. So let's do, we're going to do some dark lining now, and then we're going to finish off with some rust streaks and some blood splatter on our evil little steps down there. Okay. A couple of fun things. So for the dark lining, we're going to use, we're going to use just straight black. Okay. 
Now, when you're dark lining, we need to do, we need to be fairly precise, okay? So how can we make this black paint go on in precise lines? First thing we can do is use a long, thin brush tip to make this work. One of my favorite brushes for dark lining is the Rosemary & Co. Series 33. Okay, that particular brush has a long, long, thin bristle. And it's pretty manageable for uh, for dark lining. The other thing we can do is we can add a bit of uh, black ink. I like Liquitex Carbon Black. I have to be very careful because this bottle is broken. If I shake it too vigorously, it goes everywhere. So let's open that carefully. Put a drop of that on there next to my black paint. You see the crack in the lid. Not careful, it goes everywhere. And we are also going to use a bit of flow improver. Okay, so I got a little tiny bit of flow improver here. I'm going to put this up in the corner up here so I don't accidentally mix it with everything. And what we're going to do is I will basically build a mix of flow improver without white paint in it because I accidentally just put my brush in white paint. We'll grab some flow improver, some black paint. So there's the flow improver and black paint combined right there. That's black ink. There we go. And a touch of black ink in the mix. Now you see how rapidly that draws itself into a bead. That's going to help us when we do our black lining the line that we paint is going to naturally draw in and get smaller as it dries. And if we're careful, we can therefore get some very nice, thin, precise lines. What does that look like on the model? Let's do it like this. Let me show you. Go back. Here's uh, a base. Load up my long, thin brush with this mixture. And I'm going to go and do some long, thin lines on the model. And I can get some pretty thin lines with this paint. Okay. Particularly good for doing things like tartans, painting checkerboards, freehands whatever precise thing you're trying to do. Works really well. Versus doing it with straight paint, which does not, does not work quite as well. Harder to control the consistency brush tip jumps quite a bit more okay and also don't get that natural drawing in effect that you get with the bit of ink and flow improvement all right so let's do this on our model so where does the dark line go anywhere two surfaces meet. So if I look at my hand, where my two fingers touch, there's a dark line. So on the model, anywhere two surfaces meet like that, we want a dark line. Just kind of two basic approaches. The more difficult approach, but the one that looks better, is to paint in a way that leaves the line dark right from the start. And we did that a little bit with the approach we took of not just painting the whole thing with the base coat. The easier way to do it but it looks less precise, is to manually paint in the line. But when we're learning, this is where we want to start until we get used to painting precisely. And then we can be more precise by leaving the lines unpainted from our original shadow color. I hope that makes sense.
Okay. So we're going to look for anywhere that two surfaces meet, and we're going to paint in a black line. Let's start with these bits of damage on these pillars. So based on what we said earlier about the bottom of a line being light and the top being dark to make it look 3D, we're going to look for these kinds of scratches, and we're going to paint the upper facing surface. So not the one which we've already painted light, the one above it gets the dark line. And that makes the scratch look deeper. Do the same thing on the adjacent piece. And do the same thing up a little bit further up there. Now, you're going to find this irritating and difficult. And that's okay. It takes time to get used to this. One of the things you want to do, and it's a bit hard to get initially, is your, your position when you're painting. And you want to have your hands together and find a comfortable painting position that uses just your thumb and your two fingers because you can control that and align so that you're set up in that comfortable position but then change the position of the model to line the model up so you can always paint the lines like that regardless of where you need to be you change the position of the model not the brush so you can control that motion okay now when I do it on the camera that doesn't work because I can't move the model as much as I need to but in practice you want to get used to keeping a steady brush position and changing the, p the position of the model now in here we want to do them again on that upper upper edge Bring out those cracks. Now, I'm sure a lot of people are wondering themselves, why would I put so much effort into a terrain piece? And really, the idea uh, behind this particular selection was not so much about terrain in general, but it it's an idea about basing your models. And the more um, time you put into thinking about the lighting of your model and using the basing to enhance the overall lighting of your model, the better your display models are going to look. And when I'm putting together a model, quite often my basing is very simple, but I use it in a way that it makes the overall look the overall lighting of the model enhanced and uh, it, it it can provide a good support for a complex lighting idea that uh, falls apart if it doesn't have that sort of a assistance around it so that was the idea behind this was to think about not just like painting terrain but how can I use uh, basing elements or terrain elements to make the look of my the overall look of my model better and the intent would be to put a model a display model or whatever you worked on on this base in the center of the arch so really anywhere two surfaces meet so I'm looking for all those spots put all those lines in and I'm going pretty quickly here I'm not being particularly careful um, but that's because I'm doing this in the sort of the time limits of this video. We've already been going almost two hours. Um, but normally I would be very, very careful and precise about this. Go slowly. So that I don't end up with something that looks crude. That's going to detract from the overall look of the model I might eventually put on this as a display. And look, look how much clearly, more clearly defined this side looks than this side. Really makes a, a profound difference to the final look of the model. Now, this is not the final step. Especially where we're learning. If we make a mistake at this step, 
we're probably going to want to tidy it up and fix it so we're going to do that after this we will tidy up the dark lining after this step all the way around my skulls remember I want my skulls to look like they're attached to the stone not carved in the stone there's a mistake right there there's a good one we can talk about how to fix so there's there's the mistake I made the big blob of black right there so I can very quickly come in with a bit of water and just wiggle that and move the ink push the ink kind of clean it up a little bit that's one approach okay just kind of erase it I'll do that on the back so you can see exactly what I did so I might make, oops there's my my mess that I made get a damp brush start adjacent to that wiggle the brush adjacent to the mistake and work your way into the edge of it and saturate it with water and then just push that paint off to the side push it into the crack and get rid of it okay now when that dries it's going to leave some water stains around the edge but not too bad okay if you don't act quickly enough all you do is you go back to your edge highlighting color which for us on the stone was this uh, weathered stone color and you can go back in and touch up where you made those little mistakes tighten things back up again so if like for example right here I made that line a little bit too big I can put a few little dots of this color back in there clean it up just a little tidy it up a little bit so that's uh, that's black lining and the purpose of black lining as we finish the other side and we'll carry on now if anybody look, just offer the opportunity again if you want to post a photo in the discord by all means you're welcome to and uh, I'll take a minute to have a look at that in a sec I know that a lot of people out there don't paint along you just sort of listen in and then uh, paint the model at your own time once the video goes onto YouTube and that's that's all good I will say I appreciate very much all of you that are out there listening and asking questions uh, this is not so much fun when you think you're sitting here talking to yourself so I, I really appreciate being able to look up and see a few people hanging out in the chat and either listening or watching along <laughs> Thank you, Bell the Cat. I appreciate that I am not li just talking to myself. Much appreciated. Are you one of the people that I spoke to at ReaperCon? You don't think so? No? Okay. You were there but didn't take any of my classes. Okay. Do I have a mini in mind for the arch? No. This uh, project exists in a vacuum solely for the purpose of demonstrating these sort of ideas. I'm wondering if uh, Bell the Cat, if you entered the painting competition. Oh, yeah, I love that figure. That's one of my favorites. All right. Because I got excited and I was looking at somebody's photos, I made some more mistakes. And that's all good. Some really, really rough dark lining going on. Now, there are lots of ways to make your dark lining more precise. But that is definitely not sort of beginner content that we want to get into today but if you want to learn more about doing that you can always you know take a a mentoring class from Aaron or one of those folks 
and uh, they can teach you everything you ever wanted to know about pretty much any subject. I've been taking classes through Miniature Monthly, I just realized now, uh, since 2018. So over five years I've been taking classes through Miniature Monthly. And I feel like it's paid off. Like the Aaron is a great mentor. I've taken classes from Liz, Aaron, and uh, uh, Matt, and every they're they're all worthwhile taking. Felt a sudden need to put some more creepy red in there. I don't know why, but I'm doing it. It's a funny thing, sometimes you just like painting along and you're like, you know what, I don't know why, but I want this color there. And I'm sure that uh, there's somebody out there to explain. I took a, a um, I didn't really take the class, I guess I was asked to participate um, in a class on color theories and color psychology that Christine Van Patten ran at ReaperCon. And, uh, really really interesting if you ever have the chance to take it I highly recommend it just the idea of how certain colors and combinations give a mood and a feel and uh, you know see sometimes you don't know why the color makes you feel that way but it does and you just kind of get a feeling and roll with it you know yeah I, I see the Zoc saying he's been taking class with Aaron since 2017 and it's 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 really worth the money. You know, if you if you really are serious about um, improving your painting, there's no better way than taking classes from an expert mentor. And I've I've taken some workshops where the person wasn't particularly good at mentoring. And uh, I gotta say, like, yeah, Miniature Monthly is just outstanding. To be clear, they don't pay me to do this. I do this for fun because I like them. I don't like being part of their their mob, their mafia. And uh, I just feel like paying them back a bit. Plus, I get to hang out with Aaron and Liz and Bryce and all those folks at ReaperCon. And yeah. Yeah. All right. This is feeling like it's approaching sort of uh, a done sort of state. But I want to do a few more little things to it. So I feel like some of the shapes are really not standing out that well. Like some of the corners in here, some of the bits in these cracks. So... I'm going to take that creamy ivory color and I'm going to use the creamy ivory color to bling up just a few little spots to make them stand out better. So like in the sense of the way the light is in the center, what I'm looking for is any corners where that light would catch. So I think maybe if we have a central light, light's going to catch maybe right there and right there. Same thing on the other side like that and like that and maybe the corners of these shelves will get a little bit more light so I can use dots to stipple that color on or I can do longer edge highlights to bring out those corners either way I want those shapes to stand out just a little bit more and let's do the top of this pillar maybe right in there a little bit on that edge maybe that corner and that little bit of that broken pillar that made sense to me I can do a little bit out there that up a bit 
So I'm looking for anywhere that the light would catch a surface and giving it that little extra touch of lightness to bring it up. Make it more visible. Now, now is why I want to be careful about mistakes. I don't know if you can see that, but I put a blob of paint right there. And I didn't manage to clean it off fast enough, so I ended up with a, I'm going to point at it right there, a dot with a black dot inside it. Now, I don't really want to keep that there, so I'm going to grab a bit of this stone gray and red color. And I'm just going to put some dabs of that color to hide that blob that I made. Yeah, I didn't want to leave that as a white blob in the wrong spot. All right, back to putting some more little white dabs on there. I think the bottom of this stone, maybe the points of all these little bits that stick out, on the outside edge of that stone tablet. Now, if you mess up and cover up your dark lining, what do you do? What do you think at this stage if you cover up our dark lining by mistake? <laughs> no, not not cry. We just go back in and put the little bit of dark lining back in. It's not a big deal. It takes two seconds. That one that I messed up right there, just go back in and fix. Done. Ali Mac asked, I'm going to go back and do some more work on the base. Uh, I feel like I probably should. I haven't really done very much to that base. So what could we do to make that base look a little bit better? I think maybe it needs some more, like, um, the, the color needs to be broken up a little bit. But I think it also needs to have the black rim on... Uh, <laughs> yes, Bell the Cat. Yes, the, the, your second guess would have been better. Um, let's put a bit more black around the base. And then we'll be able to judge better whether or not, whether or not it needs more, more work. So I'm going to just take that. And we're going to put black rim around the base. I think I'll probably leave the back of that on. I won't make that black again. I'll leave that there for people to ask questions. We These minis will get used again and again and again as demo models unless <laughs> unless somebody steals them which you know happens but uh, I feel like that base could use some red I think I'm gonna take the the red make some more purpley weird gray red there we go and I'm gonna stipple some of that into the base as well along with that teal Now you could put a dark wash over all of this and that uh, would sink into the low spots. It would make all these different bits of gravel separate out a little bit more and that could work. Or we could also glaze some color in. Let's do a quick color glaze. I'm going to take that red okay, and I'm going to thin it with quite a lot of water. Oh, yeah, so um, the question was, how do I pronounce, pronounce the name? So I'm Jeff Davis, 
and the painting studio was Hecatine, a miniature painting studio. And uh, if you met a guy at ReaperCon who recommended this to you, that was probably me. Because I was doing the hard sell <laughs> all the way through ReaperCon. All right. So I'm going to take this glaze. I'm going to start here on the edges. Chris from Canada. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Chris from Canada uh, and his lovely wife and his three kids were there. Two or three kids. They were... I had a great chat with those folks. And he looped you in. Well done. So where are you from, uh, Bell the Cat? Dallas, Texas. All right. Just down... Oh, excellent. So you have a chance to go to the, uh, the weekend uh, paint club. Hang out with Kara and uh, all those folks. You could, yes. Well, you should. <laughs> I'm going to say you should. If I was anywhere near there, I'd be going down there every chance I got to, uh, to, I'll be honest, mostly to watch Kara paint. I think Kara, Kara Curley I'm talking about, is one of the most interesting up-and-coming painters at the moment. And uh, I really enjoy seeing the stuff that she produces. So I'm just adding this red in, kind of wherever I feel like it. Combined, but oh, sorry, I'm on the wrong view. There we go. So the red that glaze that I made, I added it in around the edges of the steps. The teal shows through it a bit, but it's really darkening up the periphery of the base. And I was just sort of glazing in a little bit of it on the outside of the stones. Just long smooth brush strokes adding a hint of this color around the outside and it's really creating an interesting um, I think an interesting color into the into the model do some more out here it's just this is basically the gray stone color mixed with the red that I used on the skulls Just adding in a bit. Now, because I used all that stippling technique, the various water stains that are coming from using this gray and red mixture are nearly invis invisible against that very uh, irregular looking background. I wonder if that red is becoming visible on the camera to you yet. There's a lot of red on this model now. Yeah, you've got it, Ali. Hey, Lauren. Lovely to see you. How are you doing? Are you all recovered from ReaperCon? It'll take a month. I, I hear you. I hear you. I'm there too. I keep having mid-afternoon naps, and this is not a normal thing for me. On the upside, I've been painting so much lately. <laughs> I've painted like, I don't know, I, I think I've finished six models since I got home. All right. Yeah, here, here's... Uh, Here's what I was working on just before the class. This is the Reaper Mantis Demon. Doing some weird colors and stuff on the base, but... Sometimes, like... I don't know, I'm just lucky. I am lucky, I know I'm lucky that... I have uh, commission painting customers that really, really like Reaper. So I get home from ReaperCon and there's ten waiting for me to paint them. It's just like, Reaper, let's go! <laughs> paint Reaper. Alright. I feel pretty happy with this. The last thing that I was going to do, I was going to do a little bit of blood spatter, and I mean a little bit, just the tiniest amount to suggest that there's been something bad happen on the base. And I'm going to do some weird orangey color around these little logos. Now I could have, I was going to do rust, but we could just as easily do a little bit of an OSL hint of an idea on that. 
no, that's too much for today. That's too much for today. We're going to do a little bit of, of a weird rust effect on those little shapes. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to start by taking that blood red. No, it's not blood red. It's Reaper Deep, Deep Red. Red 9002. Which is more like red violet than red, really. And I'm going to use that straight. And I'm going to put some dabs and dots of that on these little strange shapes. Like that. Now, this color is already mixed in with that color in the background. So it's going to sort of disappear into the background as it dries. It's not going to be particularly visible. What it'll do is it's going to make it a weird, irregular pattern that's going to be behind my orange. And it's going to make the orange look a bit more like a rust or a corrosion of some kind. Okay, you can see like in that one, the red is, the red is already almost disappeared into the background. All right, and now I'm going to grab that orange color. This was Carrot Top Orange. Reaper uh, Rust Orange is a great color for this. And I'm going to make tiny little dots of unthinned orange right in the middle of that. Uh, those, those other dots that I did. I'm not trying to land them in the center of the same dots. I'm just putting a tiny little pattern of irregular dots of orange over top of what I already did. And if I have a choice between like I need to cover the whole thing or just outline something, I'm going to put tiny little dots of this on the raised upper edges of the sculpt just so that the orange color helps define the shape a little bit. And I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. So better to do an outline of dots on the shape than to just paint the whole thing the same color. It'll actually look better defined with the edge just the edge painted and not the the whole thing. And in with the dark lining beside it, it's gonna look pretty cool. There we go. Those shapes really stand out now. Okay. So now to make that look really good, well maybe not really good, but I like doing this, is we're going to take, uh, let's use just a little bit of black and that weird, very goopy gray purple mix we got going now, or just basically keep throwing a little bit more of every color into the pile. And inside the orange dots that I've already got, I'm going to paint some more dots of this color. And that helps break up any um, orange dots that are a bit too strong. So I've got some big orange do uh, red dots like that all over the place. Okay, th this is exaggerated to make it easier to see what I've done. Okay, so we got big red dots like that. And then we took that really saturated bright orange And we put smaller orange dots over top of the red dots in an irregular pattern. Try not to just line them up on top of the previous red dots. Okay, so we just put them in there. And try not to make them uniform size and shape. Rotate your brush in your hand a little bit change the model position a little bit L less pressure more pressure just constantly change things up and it gives it a bit more of a natural organic feel okay and so there's our orange over top of the red and this works really well with purple it works with dark brown works with all kinds of darker colors the key is that the first color should be dark and then our second color is this orange and then to make it look really corroded, we come back with some darker color, like black and brown, brown liner, nightshade purple, whatever. Just, just a darker color than the orange. And then we put these 
even smaller dots of the darker color inside the orange dots. And that makes it look like corrosion. The finest dots you can manage inside those orange dots. And it breaks up the orange, so the orange doesn't feel quite as intense. And your brain is used to seeing, like you're used to seeing rust on cars and rust on things. And your brain knows you, that the dark spots in the center of the orange is where the metal is starting to peel up. And it's a shadow inside the center of those orange dots. And your brain will interpret that to be uh, corrosion with, with depth in it. Okay? So kind of picture it like you've got your, it's like spaces where the, it's peeling up like that and leaving a dark space in the center. Your brain will interpret that as being 3D. Okay, so that, that, was, that was the idea behind putting a few more dark spots back into that rust. And then if there's any water hitting that, and we're going to assume there's a bit of water since it's rusted and corroded. The water's going to flow down, catch on things like this lip, and then run along it. So we can take our orange, and we make a, a very thin mix by adding a lot of water to it. So I've got my super thin mix of orange. How thin? Well, let's do it the thumbnail check. Maybe even thinner than that. But with orange, they, they darken as they dry, like all paints do. And uh, it tends to disappear as it dries, especially on a dark background. So we can be a little bit more um, aggressive, I want to say, with, with our orange goo. So we'll take some of this and basically just let it flow on its own along various cracks and things that are, that are on the model. Like let it flow down along and gather in a few spots and it will look like streaks of rust going down okay and if we decide that it's going to drip through somewhere like that okay so the orange goes down it runs along it gets to somewhere like that and then it drips we can put some drops of orange on the base wherever that would have landed and stain the ground where that orange from there runs down and ends up down at the bottom. A little bit of a natural effect. Do the same thing on the other side. And don't worry if you put too much. Okay, it'll darken and disappear a bit as it dries. And I'm gonna show you now what to do if you put too much. So I put way too much on there, like totally flood it. And I put way too much at the bottom. Oh my God, look, it's running everywhere. Get a damp brush. Put the tip of the damp brush into the flood and it goes right back into the brush. Load the paint back into the brush. Doesn't work with a dry brush, but it works really, really well with a damp brush. Just suck all that paint back up into the brush. This works as well if you make a mistake and you say you uh, you put that black blob of paint on there that you didn't want. Let's do that. Let's make a big mess of the black blob of paint. Oops. Okay. Get a wet brush, load it with water, and flood the spot. Flood it, 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 flood it. Now, take a damp brush and lift out that dark colored flood of water that you created and your mistake goes away okay gone hope that's a helpful hint for people all right feel pretty happy with that oh I can see actually I don't know if you can see that but that black blob did leave a coffee stain right there so we go back to our 
greenish gray or whatever color was we were using before down there and we can stipple a few little dots of color back over the top of that and get rid of that copy stain like it was never there now nobody will know I mean except for the part where it's recorded on video and Aaron's gonna put it on YouTube and it'll be there for eternity or as long as YouTube lasts let's say <laughs> there we go there we have it all right so let's compare that to the one we did last time Similar sort of result, but different things were emphasized. We get slightly different colors and looks going on. These skulls on the left one look like they're sort of looking down into the side. The ones in the right hand one look like they're looking pretty much straight forward. We get a different lighting spotlight on the one on the left than we did on the one on the right. Different color effects. Oh yeah, blood spatter. We could do a little tiny bit of blood spatter. Really just a tiny little bit. So I'm going to get a brush like that one. Okay, and I need a pin. And the general idea here is we are going to take a pin and we flick the brush, flick the brush past the pin like that, and that will cause the paint to eject and make dots. So how much spatter you get depends on how much you load on the brush, how far you are away, and how hard you press. You just got to practice a little bit until you find sort of the right pressure and the right trajectory, and you can kind of aim the blood where you want it to go. Okay, so there's my little bit of blood spatter from that. So I will aim that into the middle of the model. And we'll have just a tiny bit of blood splatter. Oh, let's do it where you can see. Tiny little bit of blood spatter in there. Sort of in this general area. There we go. See? Right in there. And that would be a little bit of uh, an Easter egg. If you use that, when the judges see that, they'll be like, oh, something happened there. Um, I just used the Reaper Deep Red. Just used the same red that was already in the palette. So it will not be immediately obvious, but when you look closer, you'll see it. I'll just point out to you where it is in there so you can see the, the dots. It's right in there. Right in there. Let's see if I can get the camera to focus right on it. Yeah, right in there. Yeah. All right, so we're going to call that one done. A couple little stone archways. That's today, that's an old one. All right, so that's it for this one. The next class is going to be, well, the paint along is going to be uh, the Wild West Wizard of Oz lion. He's going to have some dark red skin and some cool stuff on him. That'll be a fun one. And that was one week from today. All right, thanks very much, everybody.